B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's May Day, Wednesday, May 1st, 2019. And a quick note for our Bay Area listeners. This Friday, I'll be participating in a rally in support of Julian Assange and opposing his extradition to the United States. We'll be gathering at San Francisco's British Consulate at 4 p.m., and that is at number one Sansom Street. So if you're in the Bay Area, I'd love to uh, meet you, greet you, and get your voice in support of Julian Assange. And we have news of his sentencing on the bail jumping charge, which we will get to shortly in today's podcast. But I lead with an important analysis by FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. They studied U.S. corporate media for three months, starting on January 15th. And they examined the voices who were permitted to participate, either on television or in print, regarding the future of Venezuela. Not a single commentator on the big three Sunday morning talk shows has ever been permitted to speak up against the regime change aimed at President Nicolas Maduro. No voices in the corporate media have been permitted on a very broad scale. This is stunning to me. Because even before the Iraq war was foisted on us back in 2003, those who opposed Bush's plan to intervene militarily were given some space Now, (laughs) Phil Donahue and his producer Jeff Cohen, one of the co-founders of FAIR, were fired from MSNBC because Donahue opposed the war. But at least until that firing, there was some expression of dissent in corporate media. So they reviewed 76 articles or segments, 54 of them, uh, 72 percent, expressed explicit support for the ouster of Maduro. 11 of them, 14%, were ambiguous, but were only classified as such for lacking explicit language. And another 11, 14%, took no position, but many used ideological lingo that uh, inferred support for regime change. The New York Times published 22 pro-regime change commentaries, three ambiguous, five with no position. The Washington Post spared no space, it says, for the pro-Chavista camp. Twenty-two of its articles expressed support for the end to Maduro's administration. Eight were ambiguous, and four took no position. Of the 12 TV opinions that were surveyed, ten were pro-regime change, and two took no position. So the average news consumer in this country would think there is no rational opposition to taking out Maduro. He's a bad guy. He's a socialist. People are starving. Those are the impressions that they base those shallow opinions on. The article continues, Corporate news coverage of Venezuela can only be described as a full-scale marketing campaign for regime change. (laughs) And this comes despite the existence of millions of Venezuelans who support Maduro and the simple facts that Juan Guaido, who's been recognized by the Trump administration, and the assent of the Democrats is clear. This guy has, you know, only been elected to the equivalent of Congress, the National Assembly. His party, the oligarchs, they sat out the election last year and then protested that it was illegitimate. And the language of democracy is used to support regime change when Juan Guaido is not operating in a democratic fashion. And this disconnect, this irrational support for regime change, while calling it a return to democracy, is is just breathtaking. It really is. Fair points out what we said at the time, back on April Fool's Day, that when the New York Times allowed a video op-ed by Joanna Hausman, they failed to mention that her father is the brains behind the regime change operation in Venezuela. <laughs> and, of course, this article uh, is, is really looking at opinion pieces, but the false reporting by the corporate media on the events of February 23rd, 
you know, the attempt to ram through humanitarian aid at the border between Venezuela and Colombia. And we know that the torching of two of those tractor trailer rigs was done by Guaido supporters, but the CNN and others tried to blame it on Maduro supporters. And we also know that it took the New York Times over a week to、uh, correct the misimpressions that they had promoted. The Fair article also fairly criticizes Ro Khanna. Now, he's a progressive congressman from Silicon Valley. He's impressed me. He's now in his second term、uh, with an anti war posture. But when he talks about Venezuela, <laughs> He,、uh, well, he uses language like,、uh, oh, he wants a peaceful and negotiated transition of power. He characterizes Maduro as an authoritarian leader who's presided over unfair elections, failed economic policies, extrajudicial, kill-、uh, extrajudicial killings by police, food shortages, and cronyism with military leaders. Now, those same terms can be used to describe many U.S. allies. But, Maduro is between us and the world's largest oil reserves there in Venezuela. <laughs> and、uh, you can connect those dots quite easily. So, this is an important piece. I've linked to it in the show file for today's podcast. I hope you will examine it. And I want to save special mention for the public television news hour. The Fair article notes that on January 30th, to bring two views <laughs> onto the show, Uh, they had one who was gung ho for regime change and another one who supports it. <laughs> and that is considered two views. And last night, they gave legitimacy to the guy who Guaido has named as his ambassador to Washington, but Guaido doesn't have the authority to do that. And they kind of gloss over the illegitimacy of Guaido and of this uh, uh, would be ambassador. Who they permitted to spew all kinds of bullshit. And the PBS NewsHour, like all these other outlets, just says with a straight face and with、uh, no dissent permitted that Maduro's got to go and that this is the humanitarian outcome that everybody knows is right. So let's look at today's Washington Post coverage of Venezuela. They recapped that there were thousands of demonstrators gathering in Caracas yesterday, and the coup didn't happen. Maduro gave a speech last night, and he tweeted that his opponents, including the U.S., will fail in their efforts to, quote, take our victories from us. And there is this remarkable bit of propaganda that was launched by Mike Pompeo. He's America's top diplomat, right? And as in one、uh, breath he threatened war with Venezuela, in the next breath he stated that Maduro had a plane on the tarmac and was ready to run to Cuba and take exile, but Russia told him not to. I don't think anybody believes this, except maybe Mike Pompeo. We'll get to that claim in a moment. Also, Trump kind of ignored the Russia angle and accused Cuba of conducting military operations in Venezuela and threatened a full and complete embargo、uh, if the country doesn't immediately stop. Well, the military operations are quite limited, and it's mostly intelligence gathering. And that's a role the U.S. plays in many countries with conflicts today. So the sheer hypocrisy. Of the U.S. posture and the cartoon nature of the way the media plays that with a straight face, with full stenography, is a new low for me in media malpractice and yellow journalism. And it's also interesting to see that the news outlets that are marketing this、uh, regime change and potential military conflict in Venezuela. They are forced to pause their marketing to admit, well, you know, it's not really going that well. Tuesday's events appeared to be a setback for U.S. foreign policy, says the Washington Post on page three of、uh, the printout of its six page article. Secretary of State Pompeo said U.S. officials had expected the Venezuelan president to flee the country. 
And then they apparently made up this story about how,、uh, <laughs> you know, there was a plane on the tarmac, and it was Russia who told him he had to stay. I, I mean, that is just so bizarre. The other thing that happened yesterday is John Bolton. He repeatedly named names of people in Venezuela, three key officials, who Guaido and the opposition have told Bolton、uh, are their people and ready to defect. They include the defense minister Vladimir Padrino, Supreme Court Chief Judge Michael Moreno, and President Presidential Guard Commander Ivan、uh, Hernandez Dalla. Now, by naming those names. He makes them suspects of defectors from the Maduro government, and if he's hoping that they will become valuable U.S. assets, why would he name them when Maduro could lock them up or kill them? I mean, this is a high-stakes、uh, situation. Maduro has his back to the wall. A superpower is trying to take him down. And what would you do if that superpower named three of your top officials as potential defectors? I, I, I mean, it's really brazen what the Trump team is trying to do, and it appears that they're botching it every step of the way. So, in the New York Times coverage, this is、uh, from this morning: Venezuela brace for rival protest. It's May Day. And、uh, the Maduro government has、uh, given a holiday, and as, as they do annually, and so many people will be on the streets. And Juan Guaido says, "Today we continue. We will keep it up with more force than ever." There's a publication of a tweet of、uh, 15 locations where the opposition is、uh, gathering protesters in Caracas today. And then they finally have to admit here after they promote. Regime change. While the opposition has received the backing of more than 50 countries, its momentum on the street has flagged in recent days. Well, yeah. And there's a lot of buzz because Leopoldo Lopez, who is uh, uh, correctly described as a political prisoner, he has been locked up since 2014 because he supported violent protests against Maduro early in his presidency. And he appeared in the video yesterday at the airbase where Guaido was trying to rally the military and begin the coup. And Rachel Maddow reported it as if he had just been sprung from prison, when in fact he's been under under house arrest. And the speculation is that one of the guards got a payoff from an American operative to release him. And he has since scurried to the consulate or embassy of Spain. And while he has not、uh, formally sought asylum, it appears that、uh, he is seeking safety at the Spanish embassy. And in reaction to the claim that、uh, Maduro had a plane on the tarmac ready for Havana, Jorge Areaza, the top diplomat of Venezuela. Tweeted back at Mike Pompeo, making up fake news is a very sad way to accept that the coup you backed has failed once again. Diplomacy has to be restored,、uh, restored in the U.S. government. Meanwhile, there's actually some balanced coverage from the Guardian, based in London. They've been、uh, promoting the regime change,、uh, in my view. Anyway,、uh, Maduro. Claimed that his troops have thwarted the botched attempt. He went on TV last night and denounced、uh, the coup-mongering far right supported by Trump and his deranged imperialist gang. Maduro gave an hour-long address, his first since the、uh, attempted、uh, coup yesterday, and he accused Guaido and his political mentor Leopoldo Lopez of trying to spark an armed confrontation that might be used as a pretext for a foreign military intervention. However, Maduro says loyal and obedient members of the Bolivarian armed forces had put down the mutiny within hours of its starting. By noon, there was only a small group of plotters who had, according to Maduro, chosen the path of betrayal and handed their souls over to the coup-mongering far right. I also made a note here, and I must、uh, ding PBS again because last night they did devote some time to. 
Venezuela. But it was all pro-regime change, and the only person they interviewed about it is the guy who who is pretending to be the Venezuelan ambassador from the Guaido government to the United States. And they didn't even hint at any questions about his legitimacy. <laughs> it it is really incredible to watch this play out. Also, we have a report from Mint Press under the byline of Nick Raywalt. Letting us know that the effort to、uh, spark a coup yesterday really was stopped pretty early, and there was only、uh, this one official who runs the domestic intelligence agency who bolted for the opposition, and、uh, it, it appears everybody else stayed in place. So、uh, this article points out the idiocy of Guaido. Using the language of democracy, calling for the restoration of the constitution and restoration of a democratic system. Well, as I've pointed out, Guaido's claim to being interim president lasted for 30 days, starting on January 15th. But <laughs> expiration dates don't matter, you know, when you're in the heat of a regime change operation. So I woke up this morning and flipped on the tube, and、uh, Bill Barr was there. And he is a slippery devil. He's very matter of fact as he <laughs> twists and spins and makes a strong case for his boss, President Trump. And it's interesting because last night I was flipping around TV looking for coverage of Venezuela, and CNN during the times that I stopped by、uh, was only talking about Bill Maher. Bill Barr and the letter that surfaced yesterday from Bob Mueller, written at the end of March, complaining a little about the way that Bill Barr had spun the、uh, results of the Mueller investigation. We'll get to that in a moment. But one of the stunning things I heard Barr say this morning, and I had to、uh, hit reverse and play it back a couple of times, he said that Comey was fired for refusing to tell the public that Trump was not under investigation. Now this becomes the third pretext. The first, written by Rod Rosenstein, was that he had failed to properly conduct the Hillary Clinton email investigations. Then Trump trumped that and said, "No, he told Lester Holt on NBC it was about Russia, and I'm glad that's over." And now Barr is saying that based on the Mueller report, that Comey was fired for refusing to tell the public that Trump wasn't a suspect. Uh, I don't know where he got that. Also quizzed by California's very senior senator Dianne Feinstein, Barr broke down the allegation that Trump had ordered his White House counsel Don McGahn to tell Rod Rosenstein that Mueller had to be fired because of a phony conflict of interest. It's because Mueller had been a member at one of Trump's golf clubs and had some <clears throat> some issue. About his membership fees, or something like that, and so this is where Barr gets really slippery. He was trying to say, "Well, look, you know, he told McGann, McGann to call Rosenstein, and that、uh, Mueller had to go because he had a conflict, but that doesn't mean he was going to stop the investigation. He was just going to remove and replace Mueller." You know, like they repealed and replaced Obamacare.、Uh, it's bullshit, but he's really good at delivering it. And the ultimate outcome of today's hearing is going to be: Did he lie when he spoke before a congressional committee, a House committee,、uh, back in、uh, early April, and he was asked if he knew that、uh, whether Mueller approved of his March 24th letter, which was a phony summary of the Mueller report. And at that time, Barr said no. It's now clear that he was well aware of Mueller's concerns, and the Washington Post and the New York Times exaggerate those concerns, because Mueller is not accusing Barr of、uh, misrepresenting his report or、uh, falsely presenting it. He is saying that the media. Created problems by misinterpreting the、uh, materials that were released. Now, here again, we have these two lifelong Republicans 
to insiders into the deep state and the uh, justice d- department, such as it is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Mueller says there's now public confusion about critical aspects of the results of our investigation. And he is pushing Barr to release the executive summaries that are included in the report and that were scrubbed of any uh, material that would need to be redacted. Now, Barr explains that he was not into doing this in a piecemeal fashion, and he turned Mueller down. But the media does exaggerate what's going on in the back and forth. And as I look at the New York Times coverage of what was a scoop by the Washington Post, they are still trying to drive this wedge and say that uh, Mueller's report, when it was finally released, painted a far more damning picture of the president than Bill Barr's uh, initial summary and showed that Mueller believed that significant evidence existed that Trump obstructed justice. And uh, the other comment that Barr made this morning was he was surprised when Mueller didn't reach a conclusion about obstruction, but it gave him the opening to provide his own. So, uh, you know, this is an interesting kerfuffle, but as I say, the real issue is whether Barr has lied or not. Washington Post, under the byline of Amber Phillips, uh, covered Lindsey Graham's opening comments at the hearing today, and I was still asleep at that point, but uh, she notes that uh, Graham made sweeping statements like Mueller left it to Barr to decide on obstruction of justice. And she writes, this is not true. Mueller said he couldn't exonerate Trump. That's accurate. But he uh, did clearly say that he was deferring to the uh, Justice Department opinion that you can't indict a sitting president. Then on a claim that uh, Lindsey Graham made no collusion, no coordination, no conspiracy, she writes, The report didn't assess whether there was collusion because collusion isn't a legal term. That's accurate. Mueller's team investigated whether there was coordination. That's true. They found Trump's campaign welcomed help from the Russians, but uh, didn't find coordination that would constitute a crime. Well, I think those are accurate, but the claim that Lindsey Graham is uh, somehow lying here, it's a wobbler. Uh, So, you know, we're seeing that the media hasn't let go and that Bill Barr is on the hot seat where he may have lied to Congress and this could create further problems. Uh, After the morning session, the chairman of the House side Judiciary Committee said that they have reached an agreement for Bob Mueller to testify before Judiciary sometime in the month of May. And Jim Comey, the former FBI director, has an unusual, and uh, I, th- I think uh, you must read this piece, because he, he kind of laments what happened to Bill Barr and Rod Rosenstein and these people who kiss up to Trump. He writes, amoral leaders have a way of revealing the character of those around them. Sometimes what they reveal is inspiring. James Mattis resigned over principle, a concept so alien to Trump that it took days for the president to realize what had happened before he could start lying about the man. And he says accomplished people lacking inner strength can't resist the compromises necessary to survive Trump. And that adds up to something they'll never recover from. It takes character like Mattis's to avoid the damage because Trump eats your soul in small bites. Comey continues, it starts with your sitting silent while he lies, both in public and private, making you complicit by your silence. In meetings with him, his assertions about what everyone thinks and what is obviously true wash over you unchallenged, as they did at our private dinner January 27th, 2017, because he's the president and he rarely stops talking. <laughs> it creates, it, it pulls all of those present into a silent circle of assent. And he continues. Speaking rapid fire with no spot for others to jump into the conversation, Trump makes everyone a co-conspirator to his preferred set of facts or delusions. I have felt it. The president building with his words a web of alternative reality and busily wrapping it all around all of us in the room. From the private circle of assent, it moves to public displays of personal fealty at places like cabinet meetings. This is great stuff, and I encourage you to read it. Every day I pause for a minute to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast with your subscriptions. 
people like Steve Wozinski, Judy Holloway, Benny Alto, and the great Carla Mahoney. They each kick in $5 a month. You can do it, too. Just drop by PeterBCollins.com, find the menu tab, click on Become a Subscriber. You land on the sign-up page, and in seconds, you can be all set with a $5, $10, $20 monthly subscription. Our $50 annual earns you the bonus book, 2001 the blueprints for adaptation to climate change, if we make it that far. I'd love to send you a copy. All you got to do is take out a new annual subscription and supply a mailing address in the continental U.S. Well, as I mentioned at the top, Julian Assange received a 50-week prison term for jumping bail in the United Kingdom. He was convicted the very day, April 11th, when they pulled him out of the Ecuadorian embassy in London. But today they did the sentencing and, of course, next step is to attempt to extradite him to the United States. There are concerns that he may be interrogated, including some enhanced interrogation techniques. He is being held at uh, a supermax prison that is specially uh, set up for political prisoners or high-value prisoners in Britain. And uh, there are grave concerns. So I want to invite you, as I said, if you're in the Bay Area, this Friday, 4 p.m., number one, Sansom Street, the British Consulate, will be there, and we're going to march to a, a location a short distance away. Uh, I've arranged to stream the event to the Assange video vigil that Joe Lauria and Elizabeth Voss hold every Friday, and uh, I encourage you to support our effort. A great memo from the VIPS, Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity Today, making the case on behalf of Julian Assange and that to protect journalism, he should not be extradited to the United States. It's a well-written piece with some good arguments. I encourage you to check it out. Well, Trump is building a wall, and it's a Nixon-style stone wall that protects him from Congress. He's rejecting all the subpoenas for White House officials and cabinet nominees or, or cabinet officials to testify before oversight committees of Congress as is routine. And he is now filing lawsuits to block investigations into his finances. And this is actually leading those Democratic leaders who've been telling us to sit down and shut up. Impeachment will backfire. They're now rethinking. Because if he's going to stonewall everything until 2020, Democrats will not have much to work with. And in uh, offending the members of Congress about their powers and authorities, he strikes at the kind of Achilles heel that may uh, goad them into making a political mistake, as some of the anti-impeachment Democrats argue. So I find this fascinating. As you know, I remain 100% in favor of impeachment. I think it's the only way to slow the Trump train and possibly derail it before or even during the 2020 election cycle. Here's another reason to do it. Trump has signaled that they're going to issue a public statement calling on Congress to reauthorize in full Section 215 of the Patriot Act, which allows our government to surveil Americans in the United States. Oh, yeah, there's some meaningless rules that go along with it. But uh, fundamentally, it violates our Fourth Amendment rights. And this, in my view, is a very deep incursion into our rights under the Fourth Amendment. I want to commend Democratic Congresswoman Betty McCollum from Minnesota, who has the courage to introduce a bill to ban Israel from using any of the billions of dollars in military aid it gets from the U.S. every year to pay for the detention, interrogation, or torture of Palestinian children living under Israeli military occupation in the West Bank. And this is not a trivial matter. Israel typically arrests and prosecutes up to 700 Palestinian children every year between the ages of 12 and 17. And reports indicate that many of these children were, were brutalized. 
Seventy-three percent of them endured physical violence. Eighty-six percent were blindfolded. Ninety-six percent interrogated without a parent or family member present. Twenty percent subjected to stress positions. Forty-nine percent detained from their homes in the middle of the night. More than a hundred and twenty of the children had been held in isolation for interrogation purposes for an average of thirteen days before any charges were filed. This violates fundamental human rights. The United States should not have any part of it, and this is a, a small but important step that, of course, has little chance of passing either in the House or the Senate. And finally, today, I just want to ask you to keep a skeptical eye on indivisible. These are former members of、uh, congressional staff who surfaced after Trump's election. And they kind of try to lead the so-called resistance. One of the things they're doing is getting every Democratic presidential candidate to pledge to support the ultimate nominee. And this is a swipe only at Bernie Sanders, attempting to signal that he didn't do enough to humiliate himself trying to get Hillary elected after she <laughs> rigged the primary against him in 2016. And the other questionable move by Indivisible is they have a really mean-spirited, vindictive campaign that they call "Cancel Kirsten Nielsen." Now, I have no sympathy for Nielsen. She was the Homeland Security director who put kids in cages and followed most of Trump's orders. But she ultimately refused to do things that she found were fully illegal. And I don't have any sympathy for her, but. Indivisible wants to basically cancel her. That's what they call it. And they run Facebook ads that draw posts from lefties that is are hate-filled, vindictive, and ugly, as the commentary from the right that we often deplore. Indivisible has divided me from their efforts. Thanks for listening to my ranting and raving, my daily news and comment podcast. You're free to share it with absolutely everyone. You'll find it on YouTube. I'm Peter B. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails.